Well, I'm excited about what God's put on my heart today. Um, and it's really been a continuing um, message. Um, and although these two uh, messages go back to back last Sunday and this Sunday, actually I really began this back uh, over a month ago. And uh, so really I text on there, well, it's actually part three, it's okay. Uh, but part one was so far in the past that nobody remembers it. That's why I spent so much time last week kind of reviewing it. But I'm, I'm, I'm just so um, challenged by the Holy Spirit and what he wants to do in the seasons ahead. Uh, I almost can't even comprehend it. It's, it's, it's bigger than we think. You know, Ephesians tells us that he'll do abundantly more than we can ask or imagine. And I, I've always believed that, but there's something stirring in me and really stirring in, in church leaders and prophetic voices across the, the nations as, a, as I relate to some of them and if I've listened to others. You know, something's happening in the church in this time when the world is fighting a pandemic, a virus that really has come to destroy humanity, but... It can't. Um, and, you know, sickness is the result of the fall. I've said that, and I'll say that many times. Uh, sickness is, is, I don't believe that a plague is the judgment of God. We live in the church age, the age of grace, and I know some may disagree with me, but from this pastor to this church, we're not under the judgment of God. We're under the grace of God. God put all his wrath upon Jesus, and he took it to the cross. God's not mad at us. God's not upset at us. God loves us. God wants to take humanity out of our brokenness. But when, 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 when we fell, when Adam and Eve sinned, and humanity was plunged into, into sin, sickness and disease came upon the earth. And from time to time, uh, it rises up in massive things like pandemics. You look over human history. But you know what? In this season, we have not seen anything like this, and, but you know what? The world is struggling, and God is strategizing. I'll say that again. I didn't, that's not in my notes. The world is struggling, and God is strategizing because he's the one that said whatever is meant for evil, and, and sickness is always evil, that God will turn it to good. So, you know what? God said, here's my opportunity to do something with my church. My church has been, is, is being isolated, but it's going to come out more powerful. I believe that with all my heart. It's not going to come out more powerful because, because of our organization, organizational structures or because of our administrative uh, uh, plans. It's going to come out more powerful because if the people of God will seek him, and, and, and allow him to do a work on the inside of them, we're going to see the fruit of it in the days to come. You know, that's why we, when we looked at, been studying this book of Joshua, we saw how he said, sanctify yourself um, because you've never been this way before. He said, if you'll, if you'll sanctify yourself and pull yourself apart, he said, he said I will do wonders among you. And, and I think we're about ready to move into a season of wonders. But, you know, I was, I was praying about this. I'm just kind of laying down some thoughts before we get back into the, into the scriptures here. Um, you know, what are, what are the wonders that God's going to do? You know, in the Old Testament, I mean, he, he stopped the river. Uh, then they moved on into the promised land. And, and he, uh, he, you know, he, he caused the walls of Jericho to fall down in their midst without them having to do anything. I mean, those would be wonders, but, you know, I believe the wonders that God wants to do are in the hearts of men and women. I believe the wonders are going to be the dramatic changes where God's glory touches people's lives and they're never the same again. I really believe that. I believe that with all my heart. I believe that God isn't about, you know, us going in and, and taking lands and conquering nations you know, and, and rising up armies. God's about us bringing people into the kingdom. God's about transforming human lives. The greatest miracle that ever happens is when somebody goes from, from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. When, when, when people discover Jesus and allow him to get a hold of their lives and they get transformed from the inside out. And, and you know, I believe there's been seasons in church history 
when the moving of the Spirit of God upon the earth was so powerful that people had just caught up in, a, in, in literally a tidal wave of the moving of the Holy Spirit. But I want to give you a couple quick examples of how God can change a life. It just, the, the stirred in my heart, I, I put most of my messages together, but, but I want to, how many probably know that Peter, he was the, really the leader of the band, so to speak. He was the, he was the, the one that, him, Peter, James, and John were the closest to Jesus. But Peter was the, the guy with a mouth. You know, Peter always said what he thought. Um, you know, nobody had to figure out what he, meant, what he was thinking about because he always said it. And in the early days following Jesus, most of the time, he put his foot in his mouth. You know, he, he actually, when Jesus first introduced the idea that he would have to go and lay down his life uh, and be crucified, Peter rebuked him. Can you imagine walking up to Jesus and say, I rebuke you? You know? Like, like only a guy with, that, that speaks before he thinks. You know, Peter did that. Jesus actually told him, he said to him, get behind me, Satan, for you. You think the thoughts of men, not the thoughts of God. This is over in, in Matthew chapter 16. But, but, you know, Peter went from that to thinking he knew more than Jesus to actually um, denying Jesus. He actually told him, he said, before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. And Peter said, not me. He said, I'll stand up and cut someone's ear off for you, Jesus. I'll do whatever I need to do. And, of course, we know that the, the, the Bible shows us in the Gospels that, you know, Jesus, that Peter was so afraid when they arrested Jesus that he went and hid and denied that he was even a follower of Christ. That had to have been a rough day for Peter. That had to have been a bad day when he went home and had to deal with his own conscience that he had actually just denied the one he said he'd, he'd give his life for. But you know what? It was only 40 days later, shy a little bit, that actually Peter stood up on the day of Pentecost and preached an incredible message like he'd never preached before, boldly proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, declaring that what, what they were seeing happening in the midst was prophesied in the Old Testament and you know what? 3,000 people were born into the kingdom that day and joined the church. That's incredible. I mean, the transformation in Peter's life happened in a moment. What happened to cause that? Well, we know, and we're, we're going we're gonna to get a chance to celebrate that next Sunday as Pentecost Sunday. We celebrate the, the day of Pentecost. But the Holy Spirit was poured out upon all flesh. And Peter was flesh, filled with the Holy Spirit. And Peter became another man. Peter became bold and confident. Peter became um, intentional and strategic. And Peter understood that the power of God and the anointing of God was upon his life. You know, there's another example, and I'm not going to take you there. I'll reference it for you because I, I, I want to get on back into the book of Joshua here in a few moments. But, you know, the first king... In Israel, was named Saul, and uh, he he was uh, became king because the children of Israel begged God to give them a king. They only had judges, and so God sent Samuel, the prophet Samuel, out to find him and to anoint him as king over Israel. Now, later in in his life, he he turned away from God, and God took away the anointing on his life. But at this point, there was a great anointing on King Saul to rise up and be a leader of the nation. And it says in 1 Samuel 6, verse 10, or, or chapter 10, verse 6, excuse me, he says, he, he, um, Samuel said about him, he said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. This is back in the Old Testament. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and you will prophesy. And, and pr prophecy is just really speaking out the, the mind of God and the thoughts of God so that, so that your words don't come from your head. They come from your heart by the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit came on him, and he began to prophesy. And the Bible says um, that he would be turned into another man. And I love that verse. I was meditating on, the, on my message, and the Lord reminded me of this passage, and that's why I'm referring to it, that he literally in a moment was turned into another man. And I believe we're stepping into a season where people that will, will, will allow the, the very uh, presence of God and the power of God, that, that they'll step up 
and turn into another man. Does that mean all the time? Well, when you allow the Spirit of God to lead you, you can be somebody that you weren't. And God's done that time and time again in human lives. You know, I believe we're moving into a a season where there's going to be a breakthrough in people's lives like we have never seen before. There's going to be people that that are, are so lost and so caught up in, in, in sin and, 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 and death and destruction. And God's going to get a hold of their lives. And we're not even going to recognize them. You know, I remember um, years ago, years and years ago, this thought came to me as I was preparing this. When I was in my early, late, late teens and early 20s, I always had a full beard, a really full beard. Not, not just this sort of trim down thing, but like, you know, the ones that seem to be popular again. They were really popular back in the, in the 70s and, and uh, you know, for leftover from the hippie movement, I guess. Um, so I shaved, I used to have long hair and I, I, I cut my hair, but I kept that full beard for a lot of years. And both, t- our two older sons were already born and, and, and one day I shaved off my beard. I just shaved it right off. Beard, mustache, the whole, no, I left my mustache, just the beard. And our, our second son was only two, so Carter's age. And I remember I showed up. He looked at me and just cried. Like he ran away in terror. He didn't know who I was. He said, who is this strange man in my house? And I remember it was so, it was, to us it was so funny, to Kath and I. But I'd become another man to him. I literally didn't look like the guy that he knew from birth, and he freaked out. And I, it took me a while to convince him that who I was, and I think he, he saw through, through me and, and realized I was still daddy and things were okay. Now, I want to use that as an example is I really believe when the Holy Spirit comes upon people in, in, the, in the season God's taking us into, that people aren't going to recognize them. People aren't going to know them. They're going to say, you're not the same person, that you can't be that person anymore. Uh, you say, really? And I say, yeah, I believe this is the kind of thing that God wants to pour out upon us. Um, we're on the horizon of something huge, and it's going to be the transformation of human lives. The world is going to get dark, but the light of the gospel is going to shine. In the in city center church, we have an, a, a role, a part to play in this. It's going to be happening all over the world, but you watch. But we have a huge part to play in this. Um, when the presence of God is manifested upon his people, when we are filled with his spirit... We can become a new man. Do you remember even Moses? Moses went into the presence of God on the mountain. He came out and they had, to put a, they had to put a hood over him because he radiated the glory of God and people couldn't look on his face. These things have happened in history. You watch. You watch. Now, in our study of the book of Joshua, we've been studying the story of the nation of Israel as God used Joshua to lead them across the Jordan into the land of Canaan the land of promise. Weeks ago, the Lord instructed me, directed me to meditate on this passage as as we seek to understand what God is doing in this season as he's transitioning the church. So in many ways, the church is like the nation of Israel, leaving a season of wandering And moving into a great season of conquest. And I don't mean, you know, military conquest. I believe that. I believe that in many ways the church of Jesus Christ across the nations has been wandering. But God wants to move us into a season of conquest. Well, conquest for us is harvest of men and women. I think you understand that that parallel, that analogy. We're going to go, and and I say this to city center church, we're going to move from a season of survival to a season of harvest. A season of survival to a season of harvest. A season of preparation to a season of productivity. You know, uh, Derek shared with us at the beginning of the year, and he and I had talked about it and prayed about it, that that in two years, we're going to double. You know what? Uh, We could eclipse that. We could, we could, that that could be minor. I I believe God is ready to take us somewhere. Okay, let me do a very quick, I've got seven review points, and then I'm going to move in to really what God's put on my heart as we move into the next part of this. So we began 
with, in Joshua chapter 1, we saw how, how God had told Joshua that Moses was gone, he was going to lead, and he encouraged him to be courageous and to be bold and to not be afraid, because I'm sure Joshua thought, how in the heck am I going to do this? And because uh, God said, you're going to lead my people into the promised land. And so he, his, 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 his first instruction to him was to be very strong and courageous and not be in fear. Don't be afraid of change. Church, don't be afraid that things might look different. Don't be afraid of that. Uh, and then he commanded him not to, to let the book of the law that Moses had given them to depart from them, but to meditate upon it day or night. Don't turn from the left or the right, but keep it as the foundation of all that they do. And, of course, in the Old Testament, as I said last week, that was those five books that Moses had written. But for us, it's the Scriptures. It's the Old Testament. It's the New Testament. We have to make sure whatever we do and wherever we go, we're well-founded upon the Word of God, the Scriptures that have been given to us by the Holy Spirit and been the foundation of His church for 2,000 years. And then the third thing is that we saw how God told them to take the whole camp of Israel, which was millions, and move them from their their place of of encampment just a small distance over to the edge of the Jordan. You know, when you think about it, you know, I don't know about you, but I've been camping lots. You know, putting all your stuff back together and moving it to another campground is a pain in the butt. So can you imagine millions of people? And he said, well, look, I just want you to go over there. Well, why can't we stay here? No, I want you to go over there. I want you to just go, go a few miles over there. Nobody argued. They did it. They moved to the bank of the Jordan in preparation to cross the Jordan. So, and, and I shared that in my first message about how I felt like this time of isolation that we've been through and, and hopefully are coming out of soon, but, but we're still in, was really like being moved to the edge of the Jordan. And, and why was it like that? Because it was going to give us a completely different perspective on things. And that's what they had. The movement allowed them to see things differently. They could see where they were going. And most importantly is that they would be able to see the presence of God move. And I know that, that when God first spoke to me about this season, he said, you need to call the church and especially the leaders, but all the church to pray. And that's why we started our prayer house or house of prayer. And because we really believe that this was a time to seek the Lord together and pray together. And uh, so they, um, they moved to their new location on the bank. And then, and then he told them that they needed to get ready. And, and how they were to get ready was to separate themselves far enough apart that no matter what happened, that they'd be able to see the Ark of the Covenant when the priest took it out into the river. And uh, they, if they kept their eyes on that box, which really in, in that day was the presence of God. So God's saying to us, we have to keep our eyes on his presence. We have to keep our eyes on the presence of God. We have to, and that, that's why this time of prayer has been so important. Our, 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 our leaders in the house, we had a, um, a Zoom prayer meeting on Friday night. And it was so powerful. It was so powerful just to be together and be able to pray together. So we've really are putting an emphasis on keeping our eyes on him, just like uh, Joshua was, was instructed to tell the children of Israel. And then last week in particular, we talked about sanctifying ourselves and setting ourselves apart and that God was going to, like he did to the children of Israel, that he was going to um, select those to carry the ark out into the river. And I challenge you, who would be a carrier of his presence? Who would actually prioritize his presence in their life to be a carrier of it? And that was really the focus, the primary focus, that God was going to raise up priests among us to carry his presence. Because you would be called to step out into deep water. Step out into a place that you maybe weren't comfortable in. You know, no one wants to step out into a flooding river, and it was, it was flood time for the Jordan. But God told them if they would just trust him, if they'd take his presence out into the river, that he would do wonders. 
miracles would begin to happen. And of course, we know that as their feet touched the water, that the water stopped miles, maybe I think 25 miles approximately upstream at a little village called Adam, the water would heap up. The scriptures taught us that, and we saw that. So, God is telling us, when he says move, we're going to step out into some things. But the stepping out isn't going to be the things that we do. It's going to be the carrying of his presence. That some supernatural things are going to begin to manifest around us. And we're going to see God begin to prepare hearts. I wrote down here this point. The supernatural hand of God is about to be released upon our land. Brothers and sisters, I, you know, I, I, don't, I don't consider myself to be a primarily a prophet, but I believe this is a prophetic message that the supernatural hand of God is about to be released upon our land. That some things are going to happen. And as I said a moment ago, I believe that it's really going to be transformation in the lives of people. You know, if you think about what happened to the nation of Israel, they stepped into the river and, and the, the river stopped. And when it dried up, they crossed over. But... You know, even as they moved on, and I'm not going to go and read there right now, but as they moved on, most of us know the story. They moved in agreement and unity. They were unified as one in that season. There was something happened in their hearts, and they flowed as one. And that's how come God could instruct them to walk around the city of Jericho those seven days as one. As one. They were actually told not to even say a word. Why? Because God had done something supernatural in their hearts. It was a season of miracles for them, and I believe God is taking us into a season of miracles. You know, they went into the promised land, and nations bowed before them. The Bible, if you read the scriptures, I don't have time to take you to all these. You're going to have to read those chapters on your own. But it says in chapter 2 that, that they had known, um, they had heard the stories 40 years ago when God opened up the Red Sea, and that the nations were terrified. Because they had a God that was so powerful. And, you know, they recognized and they heard that the waters of Jor the Jordan River had, had dried up like the Red Sea. It's written in the scriptures. And there, it says that the nations in Canaan, their hearts failed them for fear of the people of God. Now, I don't think the world out there is going to fall into fear because of us. I think they're going to fall into fear of the Lord. I think they're going to actually, there's going to be such an open door to reach people. I believe even now, you know, we haven't seen, we haven't seen the, the, the results of, of all these weeks of people being told to isolate because, you know, this, this virus might, might take over our nation and take over our city. You know, Brother, Brother Brad Mayer, Evangelist Brad Mayer, told, us, told me a story of, you know, him and a few others went out on the streets on Thursday and began to share their faith with some of the, the people on the streets. And they met this young woman from Lalosh in northern Saskatchewan, which, you know, had a huge outbreak of the pandemic. And, and she was just terrified, a fear for her life. She was down here in the city because they, she said, you know, it's just everybody's afraid. You know, if it broke out in our midst, fear, we'd, we'd see it everywhere. You know what? Fear draws people to God. Now, I don't think God's primary way is, you know, he's not the author causing fear, but when people are afraid, he's a safe place to come to. We know that. Now, there's something else that happened here, and this is really where I, I want to land on here for a few moments, and then, you know, I think it'll, it'll really challenge us. So go with me to the beginning of chapter 4. And uh, we, I want to read um, these verses, Joshua chapter 4. And it came to pass, when all the people had completely crossed over the Jordan, that the Lord spoke to Joshua, saying, Take for yourself twelve men from the people, one man of every tribe. Now, he didn't say the same twelve priests. He just said twelve men, and uh, one from every tribe. And I said this last week, we're not, we're not broken up into tribes. 
But uh, so, we, you know, that, that's not applicable here. And command them, saying, Take for yourselves 12 stones from here, out of the midst of the Jordan, from the place where the priest's feet stood firm. So he said, Look, I want, I want some of you guys to go back out into that riverbed. And they're probably wondering, when's the river going to come back? <laughs> Can you imagine? Okay, we all crossed over. Is that river coming back? Okay, and you want me to go out there? Okay, so he said, go out there to the very place where the priest stood holding the ark, where the presence of God, that, that really um, the, the power of his presence caused the river to heap up upstream. And... Uh, and he said, you shall carry them, the stones. He said, I want you to pick up stones. You shall carry them over with you and leave them in the lodging place where you lodge tonight. He said, I want you to go and I want you to get 12. And he actually says, to put them on your shoulders. So these weren't little rocks. These were big stones. And he said, I want you to take them back and bring them over to the place where you camp tonight. Bring them back to the campground. So then Joshua called the 12 men who he had appointed from the children of Israel, one from every tribe. And Joshua said to them, Come over before the ark of the Lord, your God, into the midst of the Jordan, each one of you, and take up a stone on his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, that this may be a sign among you when your children ask in time to come, saying, What do these stones mean to you? In other words, it's going to be a memorial. Then you shall answer them, that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. And when it crossed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. And these stones shall be a memorial to the children of Israel forever. Now that's pretty powerful. This is a memorial forever. So I, I was, I was, I've been meditating on this all week because it's been, I can't get away from it. And you know, God can show us things in, 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 Old Testament scriptures that, and, and, and use them to reveal things he wants to do in our day, in our hour. And here's what God began to talk to my heart about. He says, the memorial stones are not going to be rocks. They're going to be the lives of broken people. That he said, this is what he said to me. He said, you need to go back and pick up some of the broken lives, and carry them because their testimony is going to be a memorial to what I'm doing in your midst into eternity. Their lives are going to be a testimony. The Lord took me over to Matthew chapter 16. Most of us know this story. Matthew chapter 16, the, 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 first, or the middle part of it is when, when he gets his disciples together and he asks them, who do men say that I am? And say, say, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah. And, and, and he said, well, who do you think that I am? And, and, of course, here we are, Peter. Peter stands up and says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And, and, and Jesus looks at him and said, blessed are you, for flesh and blood hasn't revealed this to you. And he said, but I'm going to call you Peter, a rock. And upon this rock, I'm going to build my church. The rock. God's telling us that he wants to make rocks a memorial into eternity, like he did with the children of Israel. He wants to take lives like Peter, a fisherman, a broken fisherman, and turn him into an apostle of God. He looked at Peter and said, because of the re revelation of who Jesus Christ is that's in you, you will become a rock that I can build my church on. You know what, brothers and sisters? Out of the glory of God, out of the presence of God that's going to manifest out of this season, God's going to send us back to pick up some rocks, some people's lives. Put them on our shoulders and carry them until they become a memorial to the goodness of God. God just so burned that into my heart. God's already beginning to prepare that and put that together in advance. There's people out there that we've touched in seasons gone by that we, we, we probably have thought they're never going to get it right. And God is saying, no, 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 no. I want you to go back into the river. I want you to go back in and pick up the rock. I want you to go back in and grab a hold of them, take them by hand. 
because there's going to be an anointing or grace upon your life that will overflow into their life, and I'll give you the strength to begin to carry them in ways that you've never carried them. It won't be in human strength. It'll be supernatural. It'll be my, hand, my, my spirit moving through me, through you. But as you bring them back to the lodging place, the camp, the dwelling place, the assembly place, they will become, their testimony will become a memorial to the hand of God. I don't know if you can grab a hold of this, but I'll tell you what, something's burning in me. You know, Peter writes in his, his first letter in chapter 2, verse 4 and 5, come to him, Jesus, as a living stone, or no, about himself, or Peter writes about Jesus, coming to him as a living stone rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. And then he says about the church, you also are living stones being built into a spiritual house. See, those stones weren't just rocks. They represented what God wanted to do with his people. He says that we're to become living stones. And we are. Those of us, those of you that are part of the church, you've made alive. Jesus is the chief cornerstone, but we're aligned with him. But you know what? We can go back out there in the world and put a, a life on our shoulder. And by, by the power of God and by the glory of God, they can become a memorial. That's what Peter is saying, that we should become living stones to build up the church. When Jesus told Peter in Matthew chapter 16, he said, I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. He wasn't talking about this building. He was talking about the lives of men and women who God brings out of darkness and whose lives become a testimony. Brothers and sisters, in the days ahead, we're going to have some incredibly powerful testimonies about transformation in people's lives. Now, I know I've been through, I've been here 18, 19 years like many of you. We've seen many come and many go. And it's easy to become skeptical. It's easy to become a doubter. But he saved you. He can save anybody. He touched you. He can touch anybody. I want to end today with a passage out of Math or Isaiah 58. And this was a verse that God gave us many years ago. And we would, we would, we would read it. And we haven't read it in a long time, but the Lord reminded me of it early this morning, about 6.30 or 7. And I'm going to read uh, eight, eight, verse 8 to 12 out of the Message Bible, and then I think I'm going to read verse 12 out of the New King James as well. This is a prophetic word that God has given I, Isaiah that applied to the, his day, but applies to our day. And the God of glory shall secure your passage. Then when you pray, God will answer. God's called us back to prayer. You call out for help and I'll say, here I am. A full life in the emptiest of places. A full life in the emptiest of places. Some say that this west side is the emptiest of places in our city. A full life. And then he says, if you get rid of the practices of, and quit blaming victims... Quit gossiping about other people's sin. You know, so much of church history just points their fingers down on broken people. God never called us to do that. If you are generous with the hungry and start giving yourself to the down and out, your lives will begin to glow in the darkness. That's the glory, brothers and sisters. Your shadowed lives will be bathed in the sunlight, and I will always show you where to go. I'll give you a full life in the emptiest of places, firm muscles and strong bones. You'll be like a well-watered garden, a gurgling spring that never runs dry. That's the overflow of the Holy Spirit. And you will use the old rubble of past lives to build anew. The old rubble of past lives. See, back in this day, the 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 the... The cities were built with stones and rocks. The old rubble, the stones of past lives. Rebuild the foundations from out of your past. You'll be known as those who can fix anything. Restore old ruins and rebuild and renovate. 
and make the community livable again. That verse 12 in the New King James reads like this, Those from among you shall build the old waste places, and you shall raise up the foundation of many generations, and you shall be called the repairer of the breach and the restorer of streets to dwell in. God is going to build and rebuild and rebuild and renovate and renew the very inner city of Saskatoon, and he's going to use transform broken lives. And he's calling us to go back into the river and put them on our shoulder that they would become a memorial unto him into eternity forever. Forever means eternity. Their testimony will be told into eternity because redeemed and changed lives are forever. It's called eternal life, brothers and sisters. I don't know about you, but I believe the transformation we're in, the preparation for in, is because God hasn't given up on the broken lives.